It is my great pleasure this morning to welcome to UCD Professor Harry Clifton. Harry is the author of eight main collections of poetry from The Walls of Carthage, published in 1977, through to Portobello Sonnets, published just last year. Harry held the Ireland Professorship of Poetry between 2010 and 2013. Harry Clifton's imagination has always been tuned to alternative spaces and alternative times. And his work, I think, is shaped by a fantastic sense of an elsewhere, right here in our own background. We are hugely privileged to have him to speak to us today and to read from the Winter Sleep of Captain the Mass, which is the, the course text for this, this module. Harry Lipton. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and thank you very much for, for being here. Um, it's an extraordinary experience for me to come into this space uh, and to imagine that I was here, um, I won't say how many decades ago, um, uh, as, a, as a first year uh, student of English. And, um, you know, one of the, uh, my first um, memories uh, of, of, of uh, when I came in that door just, just a few minutes ago was of sitting up there. Um, and listening to a, a professor, uh, Professor Dennis Donoghue, who, uh, this was way back in the 1970s, uh, reading a, 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 an American poem called uh, Sunday Morning by Wallace Stevens. And I had just come out of, uh, uh, you know, the whole traditional Irish education system of the time which was tremendously, you know, a, a beautiful in some ways, but very, very isolated and introverted in others. And I remember the, uh, that, that moment of awakening for me, uh, which happened right here in this theater, um, of suddenly realizing that there wasn't only an Irish poetry, but that there was this giant poetic space to the west of us, the American poetry space and just how crucial that actually was to me. So it's, it's an honor and a privilege and almost uncanny in a way to be standing here, um, you know, after having had that first experience. And it's kind of like a circle that's completed itself, I suppose. So I'm thankful to see you here and, uh, you know, that's great. Thank you very much, Harry. Actually, you, you've begun to address actually the first question I was I was going to ask you, which was about your time here as an undergraduate in UCD in the 1970s. What was yeah. that UCD like for you starting off? And I suppose particularly, what spurred you into writing and supported you in doing it? Um, uh, I arrived in UCD as a completely immature um, uh, emotionally immature individual in, in 1970. And uh, it, it, I found UCD an overwhelming, a lonely place to be, um, a difficult place to be, um, hard to connect with. Um, and uh, at the same time, it was the beginning of a huge sort of inner adventure for me. Uh, and uh, as I just mentioned there, uh, the excitement came almost immediately after moving out of the Irish um, curricular um, world, that wonderful world of Yeats, um, I went out into the Hazelwood because a fire was in my head and caught and hooked, uh, hooked a berry to a thread and a, a girl appearing and so on. That beautiful nature mysticism thing of, of Irish poetry at the time, very rural, uh, not where I was coming from, then discovering as I said, uh, American poetry, um, urban poetry. Uh, um, also a huge thing for me, uh, the reading of European philosophy, because coming out of Catholic Ireland in the 1960s and 70s, um, the kind of Catholicism that was very much part of the school system was what I would call a Thomistic Catholicism. In other words, it was a catechism um, mode of religious thinking, 
where everything was question and answer, uh, who made the world, God made the world, and so on. And you became a theologian at the age of nine or 10 in this world, you know, and you were able to answer extraordinary questions like, you know, what is the nature of mortal sin? And, uh, you know, mortal sin is uh, full knowledge, full consent, and grave matter. You know, and you were, you were up there, you were a little St. Thomas Aquinas, but all this was dry, dead, legalistic stuff, you know? And then to move into a, a, a philosophy course where you discovered, for example, that Catholicism was also European, that it was also about sex, that it was also about ecstasy, uh, and start reading people like St. Augustine and so on. Um, that was a huge thing for me, and it was the combination, I think, of discovering the, the range of American poetry, which was incredible because you could have very conservative American poets who only believed in rhyme and meter, and you could have absolutely wild, far out American poets um, who believed in putting a piece of paper into a typewriter and uh, <clears throat> writing a bit of a poem, then answering the phone, and then coming back and putting the phone call into the rest of the poem and leaving it there and coming back two weeks later with some other thing that had happened to them on the street and finishing the poem. So you had this fantastic range of, you know, of freedom and form. Uh, and that, those were really crucial things for me, European philosophy and American poetry. And that was the alchemy. That was the alchemy, definitely. Yeah. Sounds like a very yeah. powerful, yeah. powerful combination. Yeah. Um, Harry, you returned to live in Ireland in 2004, having spent most of your adult life living abroad up to, up to then. Um, looking back on that time, around 2004 and in the years just, just afterwards, are there aspects of that experience of returning home which changed the ways in which your poetry was developing at that time, do you think? Um, <coughs> well, uh, I, I left Ireland uh, in the mid-1970s. Um, Ireland at that time was a very, very depressed place, and not only because of the Northern Irish Troubles, like the south of Ireland was also very depressed. It was economically depressed. But more than that, there was a kind of spiritual depression about Ireland in those years. And if you were young and you wanted to get close to life, you really needed to get, to get out of Ireland, you know? So um, for all kinds of reasons, uh, some of which I might come to a little, in a little moment, um, I, I, I upped and left Ireland in 1976 and I lived in Africa and Asia uh, and I worked in teaching and I worked in aid work and did all kinds of things um, and I came and went from Ireland uh, for over 30 years uh, and I, I, I only really came back to Ireland in 2004 and discovered that Ireland had become a different place you know when the Ireland I had left was a closed introverted society. The Ireland I came back to was open, multicultural. You know, I can see it just looking around me here, you know, uh, the faces of people here, you know, the, the complete difference that there is in, in, the, in the student body is just immediately apparent to me from, what, from those years. Um, so uh, to come back into an open society was absolutely wonderful for me in 2004. Um, and the area that I live in, which is called Portobello, it's about 15 minutes uh, drive from here, um, is really a very, you know, it, it's, uh, it's accidental in a way that I'm living there, but in a way it's kind of a microcosm of what Ireland is, you know, because it has an old Dublin community, uh, uh, it, has, it has an immigrant community, a North African community largely, but also a Chinese community. Um, and it has, um, it has a middle class um, uh, layer or stratum of people like myself who now live there. And it's a constantly evolving community. So you have a sense of an Ireland, you know, where you can close your eyes and you can hear all kinds of languages. You know, um, there's a whole, you know, <coughs> polyphony of languages there, uh, which is extraordinary to me. So that's an important element for me about coming back to Ireland now, the feeling that I'm coming back to an open society. Um, the other element I would point out is the question of form. Um, a poet is always concerned with how a thing is expressed. And because I lived for many, many years in big open spaces, like I lived in cities like Paris and London, Rome, uh, Bangkok, um, I always felt I was like, 
I was like Huckleberry Finn on the Mississippi River in a way. Um, I was being carried downstream by this huge wave of this muddy wave of history and human ecstasy and misery and philosophy and sex and everything like that. It was all this huge mixture. And to write about that, to write about big city life, um, you used big forms, you know? Uh, you write, wrote in big stanzas, and I tended to write in big stanzas and think in big contemplative ways like that. When I came back to Ireland, I wanted to be local. I found myself in a, in a place which demanded that I be small and that I be local and that I cut my cloth according to my measure. Um, and uh, it didn't take away, I think, from the emotional side of the poetry, um, which in some ways becomes deeper. But it did mean that I, I wrote smaller poems, you know, which is why recently I've just published a small book called Portobello Sonnets, you know, where I've tried to write about little microcosms of local experience and uh, just change my change my way of seeing things because I'm now living locally. So, mm, that's a, yeah. It's really interesting because it sounds like almost like a condensate, condensing of all your previous experience in one way and yet a return to something that was before it. And yeah. it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a, in, the, in the sense of the, the, the multiplicity of Portugal as, as a space to be, to be in. I'm just wondering, do you see yourself then as a Dublin poet still or is that, is that even then a name that is yeah. significant, <coughs> do, you, do, you, do you think? Well, I, I actually have a problem with relating poets to places, you know. <laughs> I, I'm not too sure I like even the term an Irish poet or a Dublin poet or anything like that mm -hmm. because I've, I have a very strong sense that a poet's first um, allegiance is actually to a language rather than to a, a place, you know. That you are first of all a citizen of a language in poetry and so for me, my real home, if you like, as a poet, is the English language, which is something that I carry with me everywhere. And it's kind of like the, you know, the amniotic fluid, if you like, that you swim in, you know, and you hope something is going to be born out of it, if you know what I mean. Um, and it is speaking itself through you all the time. You're nothing more than a medium, really, you know. Um, but uh, for me, places like Dublin, Bangkok, I mention a lot of places in my poems. But they're always just like prisms through which I hope things that are more universal are getting said, you know. So the places are only incidental. What you always hope for is that um, something, is, something is there that anybody anywhere can link into. Um, you know, like, you know, Kavanagh said about, about Ulysses, you know, that it's not really a Dublin book. You know, it's a book that a person in China could relate to because um, the things in Ulysses, the realities in Ulysses are universal human realities, you know, um, and that that's the, the measure by which something should be assessed, you know, not whether it's from here or from there, you know, so it's, uh, you're looking for a universality, I think. It's not about claiming ownership, it's about opening it. Absolutely, yeah. 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 So. <laughs> I think that's a very good point, maybe to invite you, Harry, to read some of some of your own poems to okay. split that white light. Very good. Uh, I'll just read a few from uh, from the Winter Sleep, um, and uh, <coughs> uh, where to begin? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, we're not very far here from uh, um, a very small mountain range which you will be looking out on from the library every single day, uh, the, Dublin, the, the Dublin hills rather than the Dublin mountains, actually. Um, and uh, growing up in Dublin, as I did, uh, in a sort of a post-Civil War um, family, uh, where there was a lot of bitterness, and this is probably true of people in this room, you know, that they probably heard the kind of arguments around the kitchen table that I heard. But maybe you're a little bit further down the line from it than I was where, you know, the parents and the grandparents were kind of, um, you know, they'd fallen on one side or another of the Civil War divide, which was basically, should Ireland have been partitioned or should, or should we have continued 
um, uh, you know, our so-called struggle for independence until the whole of Ireland was unified. So people who had a different vision, if you like, of the Republic. Um, and the terrible thing about it, way back in the 1920s, when the Civil War was happening, was that up in the Dublin Hills there, you know, it became a kind of a dumping ground for bodies of people who were assassinated on one side or another of that divide. Uh, and one of those people who is now commemorated is a man called Noel Lamass, um, Captain Noel Lamass, um, whose body was found up, up on the what is called a feather bed. It's just beyond Rathfarnham. And it's an area, it's a heathery area up there, still very, very wild. His body was found there in October uh, 1923. And uh, uh, he'd been, he'd been uh, shot by the, 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 the state forces uh, because he was uh, um, a Republican in the sense that he wanted uh, a complete republic. So his vision of republicanism, or what the republic was, didn't conform with uh, what, be what the republic actually became, the 26 counties. Um, um, for me, I've always been haunted by the figure of Noel Lamass because uh, partly through my own background, um, which is quite cosmopolitan, um, I've always had this feeling that there are many, many people in this country who are kind of lonely within their own society, you know, um, and who never really got to occupy the public space and to say the thing that they really were, because Ireland had become shut down and it remained that way. So my Noel Lamass figure in this poem and in this book is really the figure of anybody um, who has ever, you know, struggled with a sense of isolation within a too narrow Irishness, I suppose. I'll just read a tiny bit from that, from that poem about, uh, there's a memorial to, to Lamas up on the mountains, and it's a kind of, it's a rather uh, place full of dirt and detritus and foxes, dens and things like that now. And I'll just read a little bit about the winter up there. Um, where are we? Nineteen twenty three. The life of the country hardened against you like frost, and a new front opened. Brother against brother, choice against choice, disputing the high ground. Your eyes, blindfolded, beheld the ideal state as the real one steadied itself to annihilate you. How to survive it, the force of exclusion, the freezing out of the soul at the sight of its own execution. In the high cold, in the light snow of the Dublin mountains, a fox makes its own tracks and vanished. A single shot a hundred years of travelling echoes, family history, unmarked plots. Um, okay. Two thousand and four. It's always cold up here, even now in summer. The feather bed older without knowing it by a hundred years, a book for a pillow under my head, a splinter of ice in the soul still growing. Infinite winter hides the fox in his den, obliterates the entrance with butts and bottle tops, used French letters, the fugitive night pleasures of the Republic. 
elders and betters, Charlie, Joseph, Noel and Ass, when will you ever go to ground? Must I lie here endlessly, wait for the whole of the Dublin mountains to move and the city state at last to stand clear, a dazzle of lights forever stretching westward, groggy with nature, history, space. Again, I kiss myself good night in the name of the lost, the disinherited, all who never came back from the dead to tell their story, claim their place, and sink back into the feather bed by a memory stone, a fouled lair, Bob Cotton whispering in my ears, the sound of a car, a light somewhere, in the silences, the years. Um, so, so much for politics. <laughs> um, <coughs> okay. Um, um, you know, when, when, you, when you put together a book, this, this book took me seven years to write. I wrote it between 2004 and 2011, and it was published in 2012. Um, it makes, if I say that, it makes it sound as though I deliberately set out to write a book of poems about Ireland and my place in it. But actually what happens with a book of poems is you begin randomly, and gradually things begin to come together and to crystallize. Um, so essentially a book of poems, it's a book of individual moments um, that might not have a theme at all, but that only afterwards when you look back, you can see how it hangs together and how it comes from a particular mood and a particular time uh, and a particular set of preoccupations. Um, I'll just read a couple of poems that are just poems, if, if you want to put it that way. Um, and, uh, you know, they were just written because the pressure was there to write them. This is a little poem called October. I think it's page 33 in your text there. Um, October. And it's a, it's a poem to my wife. And it was written, uh, it was supposedly written as a 20th anniversary poem. But uh, I was still writing it a couple of years later. So it appeared years and years afterwards. And it's a tiny little poem. It's a sonnet, actually, about um, walking down a road and seeing your own wife coming towards you. Um, and, uh, you know, just uh, on an October day when the trees are thinning and, uh, and, and remembering the moment of, of getting married, if I could put it that way. And uh, it's a, a Thanksgiving poem, October. The big news around here is the fall of leaves in Harrington Street and Singh Street, lying about in pockets adrift at your feet as you kick them away. The other news is the trees. Their yellow, as I speak, is unbelievable. Not that you need me to tell you. Everywhere, the house is falling down around our ears. And it's wonderful, in the dry, spicy air, how quietly it happens. Close your eyes. Don't think, just listen. Hear that them fall, the years we came towards each other, out of a sun already westering. Look at us, even yet, exchanging tree lore, 20 years on, in a leafless cathedral, bride and groom, well met. Um. Um, <clears throat> we stay in the domestic. On page 18, another October poem is called Citrus. Um, this is a little poem about trying to um, raise a lemon tree in a climate which isn't very suitable for southern uh, fruit. Um, <clears throat> and it's partly a nostalgia poem because I uh, have southern origins. So there's a dream inside me which is pure yellow, if I could put it that way. The yellowness of the sun the yellowness of light uh, and the yellowness of the south, uh, that brightness that you don't, you don't get in a northern uh, climate. 
And <clears throat> so here we are trying to raise uh, a lemon tree uh, against, uh, against the grain. And uh, if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever tried to, to raise a fruit tree. I mean, it's a great moment of triumph when you actually cut the lemon and uh, make yourself uh, a drink with it, put a slice of it in, completes the process, you know. <laughs> Citrus. All lemons are green to begin with, all oranges. Ours, the nurslings of grey Irish light, turn yellow in winter. Meanwhile, through October, in the tall windows, higher than human height, incarnate joy against the logic of seasons goes on ripening. Slowly, a solstice approaches, drenched in cold moonshine, when the little tree, self-pollinating, like a private mystery kept behind glass, from a collapsing world, goes south in itself, beyond poverty and death, to infinite yellowness. They are selling it already on the Sicilian squares for less than nothing, as the sun moves up through the latitudes now to catch us unawares at the back end of January, still waiting in the days that never rise above themselves, to slice it for its zest against the grain of whiskey, the false lift of gin and tonic. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, all that stuff about the South. Um, I mentioned a little while back that my own background is, uh, is kind of southern. Um, uh, I, I am of a part South American origin, and my grandmother was South American. And she was what was, uh, <coughs> what was often described in the family as a wandering woman. Um, she would sort of, she lived uh, uh, a very independent life. Uh, her husband died quite, quite early in her life. So she kind of was freed up from, from domestic life quite early. Uh, my parents uh, got married in South America. My dad was an engineer who went out to work on a project in Chile after the, after the Second World War. Met my mother there, and the two of them uh, came back to Ireland to live. Uh, my grandmother came back as far as London and settled in London. And um, she used to reappear in our house uh, at, at irregular intervals, uh, and there was tremendous tension between herself and my mother. <clears throat> and I was a schoolboy at this point, and I, I'd come down in the mornings, and I'd sort of see this woman who I sort of half recognized, and then I'd go off to school, and uh, when I came back, her suitcases would have been moved up to my bedroom. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't have known what was going on completely. Uh, but uh, it seems she sort of moved into the house for a while. And then, then tensions would build in the house over weeks. And then a huge explosion would happen and a terrible fight and she would vanish. And uh, this happened ir ir irregularly through my childhood. She was my godmother. Um, and of course, as a child, you, you take things in in a certain way. And this woman became very important to me because I suppose she came to signify for me somebody who was outside family life, um, a whole element of life that wasn't contained in the sometimes kind of hypocritical, narrow world of family life where things are brushed under the carpet uh, when people don't want to talk about them. And as a result, um, she sort of embodied for me a kind of muse figure. And um, <clears throat> her death was very sad and lonely in London. Um, but she paid the price for being a very independent person. And um, the language uh, that she spoke to my mother was Spanish, not, not English. So there was this strange sense of two people passionately talking a language that I didn't understand as a child and being kind of haunted by all this. And uh, 
Uh, out of this came a poem called Mother Tongue, um, which is on page 81 of your, your book, if you have it, uh, page 81. And it, it's part of my gypsy side, if you like, my wandering side. Mother Tongue. I came from gypsies on my mother's side. There would be dawns in childhood when somebody strange came out of the night to sit at table. Father smoked, said nothing. Mother, in a language not of this world, wept and harangued. And the visitor just sat there listening. A little woman, glamorous in the manner of half a century back. Her perfume like a sounding board for the senses, now at the time of writing. Barely awake, in the hour of stripped illusions, bitter words, I drank the milk of origins like a godchild. <coughs> Lost hotels, a long prenatal chain of wanderings. And this, our household lie, eclipsed by electric light and shattering clarities, broken into. Shouts, recriminations, go inside, we'll call you. Through a wall no one breached for 20 years, I heard the taxi called. She came inside and held me to her. No one here understands me. You alone, Morcito. Years would pass. I would run away. It was out there somewhere, the mother tongue. By now, she was striking camp or putting down new roots in another town with an absolute stranger who would educate me in gambling, horses, family sagas endlessly added to nowhere written down. Sorry about the complications of that poem. I always hope when you read a poem or hear a poem that you know you don't necessarily get the whole thing but some, something comes through here and there, a line, um, a couple of lines or whatever and you can piece the thing together afterwards when you sit down with the text. But uh, there's something about reading a poem that's immediate as well, you know, so I hope we get a little together out of just sharing a, a few of the texts verbally and in this acoustic space. It's great to have the chance to do that. Uh, and I, I, I'll just read a couple more small yeah, ones great. and then we might close yep. the circle a bit, yeah? Because yep. uh, I know time is moving on. Um, <clears throat> this book, um, as, as, as you might have uh, understood, is divided into three sections. Um, it's got a 26-county section, a six-county, and an elsewhere section. That poem I just read came from the elsewhere section, and it's the elsewhere side, I suppose, of my, my Irish psyche, the part that's kind of rooted somewhere else and that I had to go out and find over a lifetime. And maybe people in this room would know what I'm talking about if they've had a similar sort of mixed ancestry. Um, that's the elsewhere side. Um, the first side, of course, the Captain Lamas side, is the, is the Republic side, the 26 counties. Uh, I'd just like to read a little from the middle section, which is called Six Counties. Uh, that's the section that I married into. <laughs> I was born, you might say, in the 26 county section. Um, my, my prenatal dream was from the elsewhere section, and my marriage, or my marital life, if you like, came into the Six Counties section. Um, I, I got married in 1987, and uh, I, I sort of moved into a, a very matriarchal world. Um, my, my wife's family are a line of remarkable women and who had very big families, um, and it was a very, very female world. Uh, um, and it was very different from the world I'd come from because it was very rooted. You know, I, my world, as you can guess, was very scattered and unrooted. Um, um, the, the troubles were on up in Northern Ireland at that time. You couldn't go out for a drink without crossing two or three checkpoints. Everything was constrained, tensions were there. Then gradually that lifted. Um, and I'd just like to read a poem about Ulster after the troubles um, and the way ordinary life began to assert itself again. Um, 
and uh, it's a poem uh, here called uh, Deep Ulster. Where have we got it here? Yeah. Deep Ulster. It's on page 55, I think, in this, this book. Um, <clears throat> Deep Ulster. It was here, the elemental centre, all the time. Eternally present, repeating itself like seasons, where the times and dates for swallows and household fires are written down. The grouse are counted, the quotas of stocked rainbows. All that love of order for its own sake. Only the hill farms and the high sheep country above politics. The enormous relief up there as the dialect names of skies return, along with their clouds, and the old knowledge opens the mind again. To dream, to just potter in the yard, to fiddle with local stations in the kitchen, where news that is no news finally, at last, fills up the years with pure existence. Lit from beneath, the fields are evenings long. The tree by the house where Vladimir and Estragon kept vigil with the stillness of commando and insurgent frightens no one. Slow through the air, a heron, shouldering aside the weight of the world, is making for its colonies, coevals in a state plantation. Nowhere but here, in the high right hand of Ireland, do the weather fronts give way so slowly to such ambivalent light. Um, and I'll just sign off with a little poem, um, which is uh, also very much indigenous to this area, um, because my wife's country is eel country. Uh, it's Loch Ney country, it's Seamus Heaney country. Uh, it's a watery, um, windy, uh, deliquescent, aqueous kind of uh, country where the elements all blend with each other. <coughs> and it's, uh, it's famous for its eel fisheries. Um, eels are something we don't actually eat very much here. Um, we're a bit snobbish in strange ways about our, our eating of fish. Um, but they are very much a delicacy uh, outside Ireland, so the, the Loch Ney eels are exported as, as one of our delicacies. Um, but one of the things that happens in the area around Loch Ney is that when the eels are caught, uh, the local people have what are called eel suppers, uh, which is where everybody meets in a backyard, and uh, there's a big frying pan, and they, they sort of uh, cook the eels, fry the eels, uh, and uh, eat them with mounds of mashed potatoes. Uh, and uh, so you either like this or you don't like it. But the eels are very strong tasting fish and very strong smelling fish. But they're a wonderful fish actually, to, a bit like mackerel, I suppose. Um, um, the eel itself is a strange animal, as you can imagine. Um, it's kind of, um, it's a shape-shifting animal. Um, and it also changes its sex. Um, in the course of its lifetime. Uh, it moves around a lot, um, and uh, I, I'm kind of fascinated by, by the eel um, in the same way that I'm fascinated by the figure of the poet, because the poet is, a, is also one of these shape-shifting creatures um, uh, who, is ne who becomes things rather than is things. <coughs> and the most famous eel of all in English literature is, is William Shakespeare, um, who is famous for becoming everything that he writes about, but actually being none of them. <coughs> so you never know who Shakespeare really is. <coughs> you know who King Lear is and Hamlet is, but all of them are Shakespeare. So this is where the eel is coming from for me. The eel is the creative spirit, um, the creative essence that is, is at the back of everything and that becomes things, but is kind of unknowable. So I'll just round it out now with this little poem about the eel. 
And again, it's a poem about coming home in the summer and wondering, are you going to go away again? The eel. Page 62 in this, I think. In the crowded yard, in the oily blue smoke of an eel supper, the eel looks on. He is home for the summer. She is home for the summer. Metamorphosing the one in the other. Androgynous, ambivalent, slipping in and out of the local, the universal. Reading about itself in the book of the eel as a disappearing species. Toying with its own myths, renewing its passports, wondering whether or not a child is possible. Longing unconsciously for autumn as the tractor roars all night and the pilot lights flash in the fields outside. For the night phosphorescence of cities, the lifelong shedding of skins. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Just poems? Far more. Okay. Far more. <laughs> Just poems. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, actually, I'm, I want to finish up with one question. Yeah, right now. And, that, and, and, and this, this is you, you're the author of eight main collections of poetry, two selected poet, uh, volumes of poetry, um, a short story collection, and a travel book. Among our audience here today, I know that we have writers. What yeah. advice would you give to a young writer who may be <laughs> starting here in UCD? Um, <coughs> well, uh, I'll answer that in two ways. <coughs> there's, the, there's the craft element of writing. Uh, I, I would say, first of all, learn your craft. As, as uh, Yeats says famously in his, his last poem under Ben Bulban, uh, Irish poets learn your craft, sing whatever is well made. Um, I think that the first thing you've got to do is to master uh, form. I'm speaking perhaps more as a poet here than as a short story writer, but nonetheless, I think form is very important. You can always abandon form, but only after you have first mastered it. That's point one. Point number two is perhaps a bit more controversial. <clears throat> um, one of the dangers about Irish writing is that it has an obsession with charming people. Um, and I think it's, it's perhaps an inborn element of the Irish personality. And it may come from historical circumstances that we have an excessive need to charm um, and we want terribly to be loved. And I think one thing about writing is, um, um, I think there's an element of coldness in writing. This that is not spoken about enough. Writing um, is a cold act. Um, and you have to be quite cold to do it. Um, you must not always be the kind of person who wants to be loved. Um, I think that it's, you have to be terribly careful in the writing world of the corrupting effects of charm and the desire to please and the desire to be loved. And I have a horrible feeling that a great amount of Irish writing has been spoiled by the, the, the desire to please instantly, the desire to ingratiate yourself with people. Um, so um, I, <coughs> you, I would love to see more people, strange as it may seem, who are hated in Ireland for writing rather than who are loved. It's an odd thing to say, and I, I'm putting it in a very extreme way, but I think um, you falsify yourself by trying to be loved instantly. So that's an odd thing to say, but I think um, if you're hated, um, it's, an, it's really love turned inside out and it finds its way home in the end, so. Harry, I've um, shared a classroom with you on, on and off for over about 20 years. Mm -hmm. 
it's just great to have a chance to do it again here. So just thanks a million. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for tuning in.